this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddha and the Yogis retreat at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Good evening. Thank you for being prompt again and um, for putting in such a nice long day with us on various fronts and uh, fueling up at the dining hall between times. So we um, have gotten the request to have a few more questions tonight. So we have a few things we could also talk about if no one has any more questions. However, um, we're going to begin with a chant and then open it up to questions relevant to anything that we've covered. Um, and and um, so that's where we'll start. I don't know where's a visor. One of those Cambridge visors there was clear. It's against the light. Okay. Maybe we should do both. So we're going to do. Um, can you hear that? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Distinctly, clearly, yeah. easily. Okay. So we're going to do two chants. Um, we did one this morning. We're going to do the Triumphakam. Oh, good. Uh, and a nice part of this chant is the word Ubarukam means either a cucumber. <laughs> Or it doesn't quite mean a watermelon, but it can also mean a big squash. Okay. So wood rukam eva, like a big cucumber stem. So banda, banda is the stem. So when you pick a ripe, uh, because most of us are so far away from farming, even though our ancestors were quite involved in it. Uh, there's certain things like melons and fruits. Like when they become ripe on the vine, the stem finally shrivels up and it just breaks off easily. So that's us. We have been cultivated by um, the Triambakam, the three-eyed one, uh, who is either Shiva or Shiva. Uh -huh. And they both have three eyes. And both, they are Sugandim Bhushtivardhanam. And so Sugandim means really good, good fragrance is what it means. And it's someone with impeccable taste, you know, like a, a connoisseur. Uh, Pushtivardhanam is also the expert cultivator. And so we have been cultivated, and then finally, uh, our, the gourd is ripe, or like cucumber is ripe. And then, um, it can, then we're asking them just to free us from death with the amrita, the nectar of immortality. So we're being plucked. 
Anyway, it's an interesting, kind of a fun thing. But I like the tune. <laughs> oh. language 
conversation. Where does Tibetan come in in terms of Sanskrit and Pali are the oldest languages, but was Tibetan right in there? Are Sanskrit and Pali the oldest languages? Oldest language? No. First language? No? They're pretty young. As time goes. What? Are, are, Tibetan, are Tibetan and Pali, I mean are Sanskrit and Pali, yeah. the oldest languages? Uh, well, Vedic Sanskrit, I think, is one of the very old. oldest. But then there's... The old Chinese characters that we have, Egyptian mm -hmm. hieroglyphs. I think they're older. There's actually pre-Vedic Sanskrit, uh, which nobody actually knows. But, <laughs> but it's, it's related to um, Pallavi Farsi, which is the language that the Avesta was uh, composed in, mm. is the Zoroastrian text. Right, and it's and it's very close to Vedic Sanskrit, um, and then Pali was spoken. It's so the thing with Sanskrit; it, it isn't really a spoken language. It never was, except there, there, are a lot of Brahmins I met, and there are actually villages of Brahmins where they speak Sanskrit. It's just two of them in in class. No, they actually speak it on the street. Oh yeah, it's a matter. These are small villages where everyone is like. It's a little bit of a pride thing, yeah. you know. Uh, but it's not really a practical language for speaking. It's, it's too it's proper. And so it always comes down to a spoken, which, and you, can, you can't really, you can hang out in Sanskrit with your pals, but you know, when you start using slang and you want to shorten words, it's not a good language for that. So then you get Pali. So, yeah, you know. oh, supposedly Pali is a, from the colloquial language. And then she's wondering. At the time of Sanskrit. Where she's, her question was also where does Tibetan fit in? This? Where does Tibetan fit in? <coughs> Tibetan is, is, a, um, is a different language, and it's very much related to Burmese. And um, it, uh, it has loan words with Chinese, but it's different again. But uh, the, the, it, it has actually some sort of connection with. Uh, with the Chinese, but it's not that they, since the Chinese invaded, they call it Sino Tibetan, but that's really fake. It used to be Tibeto Burman, was the language family by itself, and connected a little bit to Thai, so Tibeto Burman. But what happened was that when the, the seventh and eighth centuries, because it's seventh century, the emperor of the Tibetan Empire, they were quite a bunch of conquerors, like Genghis Khan sort of thing. Uh, and he decided he wanted to translate. He noticed that all the big kingdoms around his empire, which he some, somewhat conquered actually at different times, but they all had, uh, Buddhism was a kind of matrix, uh, a powerful matrix of their culture, monasticism, Buddhism, all kind of arts and sciences connected with that. And so he sent someone to create an alphabet out of the Sanskrit alphabet to fit the Tibetan language rather than resorting to Chinese characters, you know, which, because of a certain monosyllabicity that it had, it could have lent itself to Chinese characters, actually. But instead, he, he modeled it on the Sanskrit alphabet to create an alphabet, and, I mean, he, he, the, the guy he sent, the minister that he sent, his name was Termi Sambota, and he, Termi, really, was his name, and uh, he had a really hard time doing it, and then he had a vision of Manjushri of how to do it, sort of like Panini and the Sanskrit uh, sutras, you know, Shiva sutras. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the way, we, because it, it is a monosyllabic language, so written in an alphabet, uh, you know, it could be the same ma, 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 it could be different things. But it's not quite as formally tonal as Chinese, you know, with four tones, and he doesn't have that. It's somewhat tonal, but not formally. So the way he did it was he took letters and he would put them in front and underneath and around the sounding initial letter and the, and the ending consonant of a syllable. And the different letter, would, but those letters would not be sounded. So they wouldn't be silent, but they would show that this is the ma that means, you know, a wound. This is the ma that means a mother. This is the wa ma that means a, a, a weapon. And so on. They were, they were, it can have to be a horse, or it can be a horse. So, so therefore, and then, then they, they created particles to mimic the Sanskrit declensions. And so it's sort of a bridge between an infected language and a, and a, you know, a, 
diagraphic language, or whatever, I forgot what they call it, I think not diagraphic, but something. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting bridge between that. And the Japanese did a similar thing, but with a different flavor. They took the Chinese character and made phonetics out of it, and they, yet they used some of the Chinese characters, and then they used uh, phonetic symbols that are made out of Chinese characters. So they have this combination, they made a different kind of combination, because they're more China influenced. But uh, uh, the Tibetans, they made a complete thing, so that they created, therefore, an artificial language precisely to translate the literature of the Indic sciences, especially Buddhism, the, you know, and uh, but the arts and architecture and medicine and all sorts of things. So it fits very closely with Sanskrit. You can you you could trade get a computer. We tried several times, but we didn't get funded. You could take a computer and you could pretty much put the Tibetan words in there in the cases that they are. You can generate a Sanskrit text just zoom this better, but pretty much. And uh, and you can't do that with Chinese. The, in Chinese, they translated things over many centuries from Sanskrit different ways, and there, there's no system. Kind of. No, there's, there's, no, there's a little bit, but not too much. So you can't really be sure about what you can reconstruct in the sense, a lost Sanskrit. But you can't go to Tibetan very, very well. And they consider, you know, Tibetans worship India. They consider it, they call it Aryabhata, the land of the noble ones. And they don't mean by Arya also anything class level, or would have changed the meaning from, of Arya from sort of class and or even earlier, maybe a racial thing. And they and they it meant one who has achieved a degree of selflessness, where the other person's feelings are as important as your own, that makes you an aria. And some degree of that realization of selflessness is required for that. In other words, you have to empty, be somewhat emptied out, and then suddenly other people's feelings start impinging upon you. And again, there I think the females are a little bit ahead of us. <laughs> Natural. In fact, so much so that they think that's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, like the four, the four truths are the four truths of the no, of the Aryan. Yes. Rather than the truths themselves, but they're the truths of. That's right. Aryan. And so he meant that those when one has achieved a certain cognitive status, that was, he changed from class status, which yeah. it was in his day, and then I think racial status much earlier it was. You know the Dasyus and so forth. There was a color thing in India too. And then um, it, it made it into a cognitive thing, and th which I love it because uh, because it's like noblesse oblige idea, you know, a proper a proper leader or someone who's uh, you know responsible for people feels you know things looks out for them, you know, you know right? The noblesse oblige, you have that you know that uh, that concept. So that's really Buddha was very smart that way. Yeah. He redefined I, things. Yeah, I, I think uh, the Buddha did a. a in some ways, an upgrade. Yeah, he did of, a 2.0. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did. You know this Patrick oh, Olivelle? Oh, yeah. yeah. He said something that I blew my mind that he gave a talk at Columbia about 10 years ago. He said he had discovered that in all of the literature of the Brahmanas, the, the Aranyakas, and Upanishads, not to mention Vedas, he said the word Dharma only occurs 17 times. He did like a study of all of that, that you know, he translated all like you know, laws of mana and every kind of thing like that. Dharma is not a common word. It only occurs in the context of the Rajasuya, of the royal consecration. And the word that later Dharma gets used for was urta, you know, in the Vedas, you know, urta. But Dharma simply doesn't really pop up until you get the Mahavira and Buddha. I mean, they all yak about Dharma. Then later Sanatana Dharma. But they didn't use the word, he, he thinks, you know. It's very really interesting. Back to their question. Oh, is that good? We can spend forever on <laughs> any of these questions. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the. Uh, there's one here. Like, here comes the mic. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Ah. Um, I had a question about the injured innocence meditation and um, why you needed to choose a memory rather than use um, an experience and do it in the moment. Why was an it important in the that, moment? Why was it important that you use, um, or the meditation is based on a memory um, rather than um, like 
if you experience something in the moment, then meditating on it? Well, it would be fine to use an experience in the moment if someone would falsely accuse you at that moment, come up to you and you know, tell you you're no good and blah, 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 and then, well, I'm good, you know, then you can meditate on that. We could arrange it. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> that was the setup. Guruji <laughs> can come and do that, yeah. But even then, you no, know, part of it is the sophisticated sort of splitting of the consciousness and developing a consciousness where your main energy is in enacting the motion and the reaction, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, like an actor, as I said, like actor studio, you know? But, uh, and if you had it in the moment, your whole consciousness would just be reacting, you know? So then, then um, even if someone did come and insult you or something in an unprovoked manner, uh, you'd be maybe too fresh in the emotion that you have to like, so the memory is considered, it's an important key. You know, you can, I, I mentioned you can ask, well, why not when remembering something where you were really angry? Because then you get very absolute, right? And you break up from everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're really in a rage, you know, driven by rage. But uh, I think the reason is you disappear in the rage. So you can't really be remembering yourself well. So before you blow up is, is, is the place to catch yourself. Mm -hmm. And it takes time, though. So it's, it's an effort. If someone just came and stepped on your foot or something, or whatever, you know, that would be immediate, but you know, then you might like step, kick them back before you meditate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, later so. when you find out they did it on purpose, then, <laughs> then you get more and more angry. <laughs> <laughs> if it was an accident, it's like, uh, okay. But when you practice the notion of bearing witness to things and, and not, and, and being fully, fully, whoops, fully, um, connected at the same time as being able to be grounded, mm -hmm. then over a period of time you might be able to be in that moment and yeah, that's true. and do it. But it, that's it a is good side effect. Yeah, it's but it's something that, you know, you have to kind of cultivate this sense of being able to and it, it usually it's easier to cultivate that you know, towards others first. And then once you've done it a lot then maybe when you're in the heat of the moment yourself, you get lucky. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> also, I think you can go back to the moment. Yeah. If you do it well, you will go back there. Because those moments are still there, those you know, little traumatic thing or something that you know, we still we carry all that around with us. And, and so the, the idea of bearing witness is that you not then um, draw conclusions, that you not, but that you are right there with it, that you not, try to answer questions that you not try to uh, come up with reasons mm -hmm. for like why did they do that to me or why did this happen but instead you know you're really there but that's mm -hmm. very 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 difficult to do in the moment um, it's not as difficult with someone else when you're just listening to them but with yourself in a difficult situation there was somebody raising hand over there. Over here as well, Bob. Yeah, we um, oh. So the Vedas tends to, uh, the divine masculine tends to be a lot more represented in the Vedas than the divine feminine, right? There seem to be a lot more gods than goddesses, to say the least. But they made um, the goddess of speech, Vaj, which is arguably one of the most important roles in the Vedas because the Vedas is all about sound, right, and speech. And so I was wondering if you could kind of comment on that. It's sort of like an early representation of the divine feminine in an otherwise very masculine patriarchal system. Why do you think they chose goddess uh, speech as a goddess? I'm not, I'm not, I didn't really oh. catch it all. Why? So like the verse we chanted. Yeah. The verse we chanted is Big Beta. Yeah. And it's not late, it's middle, you know. It's six Mandal, yeah. Six Mandal. And this is Saraswati. And right. Saraswati was one of the three veni the three rivers. And uh, and so there was you know, everyone lived along the rivers. You know, like not only trees and plants but people too. And so this is a 
and I'm only just making this up. <laughs> so this is a culture, you know, these were uh, people who had chariots and horses and, you know, would go to other lands and uh, did fire sacrifices. They were, you know, a, a, a tough bunch that then gradually was settling down mm -hmm. uh, and becoming, you know, farmers and uh, more domestic. So they start, they are appreciating the, they're appreciating nature. At the same time, um, a lot of the poetry of the early Rig Veda is gorgeous. You know, they were, oh, these were, mis these were nature mystics. Uh, you know, drinking Soma, whatever that is. Stoners. Yeah, stoners. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and just in total, and some of them were, they were just in awe of the, the beauty of things and yeah. probably the interconnectedness of things. And so there were, so there's, there are all these little bits of this huge appreciation or understanding of the feminine. But as a culture, uh, it didn't, uh, it's still the male deities. Mostly know, were, male, only mostly two or three female. female. Yeah. Why language? In the Veda. And why language? Well, the, the idea that language is the creative principle. Um, and so, and so the creative principle is basically Mother Nature. And the Samkhya system isn't actually Vedic. Uh, it's considered the first Tantra. In other words, it's developed perhaps by people or peoples who rather deliberately or uh, just culturally outside of the Vedic community. And so Prakriti uh, is a Purusha. Purusha being, meaning the guy. Uh, is obviously a male word, but kriti is a female word, and so creative energy, which is anything that is experienced, anything that is perceived, even the idea of prakriti purusha, that is all prakriti, which is feminine, and which is ling linguistically based in terms of its uh, layering of information, not necessarily language as a spoken language, but language in terms of one thing in mind representing something else in mind. And that the whole creation is actually language. And, uh, and I don't know if somebody had that insight. Who knows? <laughs> it's a good one. I like this. There's a great book that uh, I used to help my students read <clears throat> in, in, uh, yeah, in when I was in the first decade or two of teaching called The Wizard of the Upper Amazon. And uh, I would have to read that to try to understand the Veda and some of these ancient epic, also you know, Greek ancient epics and things, because that that what that is is it's written by a Peruvian doctor, who in his youth, when he was 16 or 15, his oh he was with his uncle and aunt in the jungle part of Peru, at a rubber plantation, and then they were attacked by a, some tribals, who killed everybody but him, and they kidnapped him. And they took him and they brought him up, and the head shaman brought him up to be the next shaman. Because he, he, he well, of course, he, he measured up, he was smart, and then second, he thought it would be good to have a Latino be their shaman who could sort of step in both worlds to save his little community. But what they were ayahuasqueros, you know, they would take ayahuasca on the full moon, and then he did, there were many hundreds or thousands of verses that this shaman would chant. And when he would chant it, the, the, all the members, unfortunately the males only, but the members of the tribe would sit around and they would all see what the chant was about, like a hologram in the middle of the, of the thing. So they would give, develop a collective mind. And then they would even see a jaguar or a, you know, some kind of deer-like animal, that, you know, food animal. And, and then they, if some one of the guys in the community was having problems about their hunting, they would kind of let him see what he was doing wrong about the jaguar. And I mean, and it was completely came out of the verses, the vision that they, they all shared. And this guy learned all that, and he, the way he would learn it is they would give him low dose uh, when he would in his training sessions, and he would lie in a hammock, and the guy would recite it all, and then he would see it all as he would listen to it, and then he memorized thousands of verses, he became their shaman. And, but then, they you know, things went bad, there were more settlers, and so, and so eventually he escaped, or he, he left. He didn't want to leave his people, he was adopted them, and the old guy died, and he was their shaman for a few years. 
But then that whole thing fragmented, and then you had to leave, and uh, or some neighboring war, and they had a battle, and they, you know, the Brazilians got them. I don't remember. But he, he became a doctor back in, in uh, Lima, and then he wrote that book. And uh, I always imagined that something like what the Vedas, what the world were about, you know, that they were, they were seeing these things. And one of the things that you can say about it that's very important is in the Vedic ritual, when they never had, they were aniconic. They didn't have any images of Indra, the chief one, or any other gods. And they would, or Agni, you know, and they would put a mat, a seat, a seat like a yoga seat on the side of the ritual and invite the god to come there. And, um, and obviously they did. In other words, they would, they, they would meet the god, so they didn't want to have an image because the god himself would... Well, the Ganesh chant we chant, Ganapati Kamihavana Yeh. Yeah. Um, that is early Rig Veda, uh -huh. second Mandala. Uh -huh. um, and it's, they have a seat, and they just have an empty seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're inviting Ganapati, and at that time, elephant-headed Ganesha really wasn't part to anyone's knowledge. The Ganapati just means Lord of the Ganas, right. of the hosts. Um, right. And yeah, so in that sense, you know, all of a lot of the you know, this is before a lot of the. Uh, you know, where did all of these other things come from? <laughs> Probably from other peoples. Yeah, well, inter it seems that it them. seems that the Harappan people, the people in, who were considered dark-skinned and were considered farm people. Nomads always think they're superior to farmer people because they can beat them up, usually. And uh, you know, like that's why China built that big wall, you know, against nomad people. The nomads are tougher, and uh, they sweep in. And they, in the early Vedas, they have some very derogatory things to say about people who live in cities, like they're insects or something. You know, like, and they ask Indra to stamp. One of Indra's names is Grama Gataka, which means destroyer of citadels and so on. But it seems that those people there, who I think are currently the Dravidian people, personally, my personal opinion, but I'm not an archaeologist, uh, they, uh, they were, you know, some of them stayed north, of course, but some went down and became the Dravidians. And uh, they were mother goddess worshippers, they had temples, and, you know, they had, they were city people, you know, they had, like, more agricultural surplus, they didn't have to go out and, like, kill a yak every time, or a cow every time they wanted to have dinner. And they were much so more mild, and therefore they were invaded gradually by those Aryan types. And that, that came down from Iran down the Khyber Pass. And then they were grumpy because they couldn't find any soma mushrooms down in India because they didn't grow in low altitude. And then they, they smoked pot instead, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that changed the... Uh, yeah, it seems, it seems. So, anyway, I don't know if that answered your question. But one thing I want to say about gods, though, I detected maybe earlier in your question about how the Vedic things seem to have more gods. Well, actually, I think the, this is another misnomer about Buddhism. Buddhism never denies the existence of the gods. Never. It denies that any one of them has omnipotent power, because that's, or is that any one of them is absolute. So it relativizes everything as the whole discovery of relativity. But it never denies their existence. And the gods play a big role. One of Buddha's names is Deva Manushyanam Shasta, which means the teacher of humans and gods. And uh, because the gods are really powerful, this and that, and it's like, what's happening? You know, like, they're not quite sure. They're, they're big, and you know, they, they, you know, they, but they're not quite sure. So they have to take advisors. You know, they, have, they seek advice, like a reasonable leader does. They did the Twitter. They use Twitter too. I used to Twitter too. Brahma, Brahma, Twitter. And but Brahma likes Buddha because Buddha tells people that when evil things happen to them, it's not Brahma's fault. Brahma's a nice person, and everyone has their own karma, and you know they're sort of a mutual. They mutually do good and bad. You know? So, I, uh, you know, but, but they're not monotheistic. And they're not, uh, you can say Buddhism is not monotheistic, and monotheism means a creator god. And it's not really polytheistic in that you can have alternating creator gods, because there's just no creator gods, but there's plenty of gods. They're into them. In fact, poor Buddha, if you look in the Pali literature, not just the Mahayana one, you know, the Buddha is supposedly in his hut, you know, like from like mid 11 or 10 p.m. to 4 p.m. or something, and they, 
and they told somebody comes in and they say, don't bother him, he's just getting his rest. And then it shifts the scene, shifts in the sutra to inside his hut, and there he is. And some deity who's falling from this heaven down to another plane and not sure where he's headed, maybe below the human level, is calling out to him in the bardo. And say, and he turned out to be the rebirth or the bardo entity of one of the kings who was one of his sponsors and a friend, kind of, you know, Bimbisara. And how, what do I do? And then so he gives him like a little, it doesn't, he doesn't say if he does a miracle to help him land in a, in a good school or something or in a nice, nice town. But uh, it just says, you know, it gives a, records what he says to him. So apparently the poor guy is up day and night. Because technically, since he's in the clear light all the time, he should never get tired. He you know? doesn't have to sleep, but it seems like he's overworking. <laughs> <laughs> in the sutras. In India, there is a tendency to say the Buddhists and the Jains are the non-theistic traditions. They're sort of used to saying that, meaning that they don't look to God for salvation. They look to, you know, they have teachers and then they try to practice it. You know? But then when, when His Holiness has dialogue with them, and the Dalai Lama has a dialogue with Muslims, I, I say, please don't say you're non-theistic, you know, don't say that. Not to the Saudi, uh, Saudi Bula or an Egyptian, or that. please don't say that. Just say, oh, how do I say that? I say, well, you could say non-monotheistic, or... And then I gave him a term, I said, say you're infinitheistic. <laughs> but he didn't like it. He didn't like it. But he likes to debate with me, that's why. It was because I said it, he, he wasn't sure. <laughs> but it's good for spiritual people to know that. You know, the positive language in it, the clear light of the void, this kind of thing, is very much like, uh, you know, like the energy, all creative and all kind and all abundant and all nourishing energy, like mother energy. You know? And the mother goddess thing in general in India is like that. You know, it's not like just some guy up there like making water and like bouncing around, pulling people's ribs and things. I would not do that. <laughs> but you know, the idea of. <laughs> of setting a seat, of offering a seat for Ganesh or setting, yeah. is, is a really important idea um, that stops this notion of division between, between the sexes, in a way, where mm -hmm. you're setting out your, you know, you're offering this place for whomever, the god or the goddess, to come. And with, without, you know, with equal enthusiasm whether or not they show up. Mm -hmm. And so there's not this preconception that you are doing something for someone separate. There's not the preconception that there is some payoff in it. And so nice. on some level, it is a gesture that's built into some of these, these chants, is that, you know, that, that we're, what we're trying to do is just offer. <coughs> and then see what happens, and then offer again. And not, not have some preconception about what it is we need, because that's the moment that it flips, and you start defining things in a way that then becomes destructive. Yeah, the invitation. Yeah. And then it's up to the other person to come or not. And and it's just like we we invite Mulabanda. Yeah, or the, the sincere, you know, like reaching. We haven't quite done that yet, but that's in the class where, you know, we do in yoga class, like you offer your heart to the gods. Oh, right. With the right alignment, you sincerely. have to shoulder by the hand. Sincerely. But you don't offer it like that. Like, here, take it. As it's a deal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the whole idea then is that um, one of the teachings in, in bhakti, basically, is that uh, at a certain point, after you have practiced and practiced, and then finally enlightenment comes out of meditation. Uh, and so it's not a mechanical process where, you know, basically the ego then masters a particular chain of sequence and puzzles and stuff, and then I've got it, but it, it's more like I disappear when there's 
So it, the, the enlightenment comes, or because the everything is already a gift, and and it's more or less just like giving up that um, concept of it as a thing to be grabbed or taken, and then it arises of its own nature. And so likewise, so we invite Ganesha to sit down, figuring out, well, why would he come and sit in my pelvic floor? I mean, they're probably nicer seats. It's a pelvic floor, it's okay. But, and, uh, well, no, to, to such, a, such an enlightened deity, pelvic floor yeah. is perfectly nice. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. Perfect seat. It's all made of light. It's already sitting there anyway. It's a giant, giant 64 petal lotus. Support it, support it, support, you know. And each petal of a lotus has a goddess and so forth. And I'm sure they're having a nice time now. Just a great time. So we we'll give us 64 different massages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question here. It's wonderful. The, the other thing I think is that the, the from the Vedic somehow, the Indian people, and partially, and partially I think also because of the tremendous wealth, and also because the meeting of the Matrilineal Harappan thing, which I speculate is was matrilineal. Um, how many of you know the work of Maria Jimbutas? Do many people know that work? Any, or anybody know that work? Good. Oh, you, oh, you know. Uh, so she was. She discovered in the Danube, which was the alluvium, the richest alluvium in Europe. Uh, she discovered by digging there that there seemed to have been 90,000 years of matriarchal or matrilineal, she doesn't, wasn't sure, culture that was very much less violent than anything we've known in the last 10,000 years. And um, she, so she created this whole, she wrote a book called The Civilization of the Goddess. She was a very famous archaeologist who was the, she, before that she had dug down to 5,000 years ago to some people called Kurgan people who were like the Aryan people who went to India or the Western people to Iran, they also went out of, because it seemed like the Central Asian steppe became more dried out or something, and they, they started migrating into the cities, into the river valleys. And, um, and so then she was celebrated for digging up the boys, you know, the home piece, you know, the conquerors. And when she dug deeper then, celebrated and put in charge of gigs in the, in the Danube, but then in Romanian places. And then she dug deeper and she found all this matrilineal stuff. Then they hated her. Then they wanted to kick her out of Europe and everything, so she ended up at UCLA. <laughs> but she, they were annoyed the idea that there could have been a long period of time that was more female-dominated, uh, that was a little more peaceful and less violent, and, and, but they, they couldn't tell that much about it. The Chinese have a legend also that there were, the Yin Dynasty, they call it, or Shang Dynasty, was matrilineal, and they consulted the female oracles for you know, divinations and things and not sort of male rituals. And, um, but they look like the Confucian people, by about 1200, 1500, uh, the, where Confucius got his lineage, the Zhou Dynasty people, they look back at it with horror. That was really terrible, and we're so happy we escaped. It's an embarrassment. Yeah. Embarrassing, right? Yeah. So I think in India, you have the matrilineal, because the matrilineal goes well with the agriculture, the city, the cities are built around temples, and the mother goddess thing, and it's so abundant, you know. Uh, the Indian, uh, uh, you know, the Punjab, you know, was like, yeah, I'm sure it was the Indu, Indus River was Eden. And that really is what Eden was, was the garden of Eurasia. And then the Ganga opened up, and then the South India River, Alluvia, Narmada, and uh, all of them. And, and it just still is a really rich place, India. It's just a little over and whatever, and the Brits wrapped it off, you know. And then the Brits ripped it off with train loads of stuff. And then they started having things like, how come the Indians didn't get rich like us in London here? <laughs> well, you guys took it all. Like, no. Anyway, so, so the, 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 the mother thing is a very, very important thing. I think if you, if you don't know her work, you re I really recommend it to you. Um, Maria Jimbutas, G-Y-M-B-U-T-A-S. And, and a woman named Mariana Eisler, E-I-S-L-E-R, wrote a kind of popularization of it that simplifies it, though, and is very, very good, called The Chalice and the Blade, Mariana Eisler. And those, those works will really actually thrill you and change your view of history that we are, that is stuck on us in this culture where everybody's been fighting the whole time and therefore we have a really huge Pentagon budget and that's about it. And there's nothing else to think about spending money on. No daycare. 
So that's connected to our sense of history. So do take a look at it. I'm sorry for that digression. No, no it's right. <laughs> Sarah. Does it work? Okay. My question was about the meditation that we did this afternoon. Um, it seemed like it really took me into the Samkhya model of the mind, as far as starting with, from this place of needing to have an experience of the self, so that you could then dissolve the self. I'm sorry. Oh, she was saying that the meditation this afternoon yes, seemed to come from the Samkhya model of the mind, reminded in her. which you are reminded you of it in which one has to seek to have an experience of the self in order to dissolve the conception of the self. Right. And, uh, well, and then at the it, end, it, when it, you went into the diamond, what was it, the diamond cutting drill, there's this play yeah. of the looker and like the seer and the seen. Well, they say Buddha was born in the city called Kapilavastu, and the ancient sage Kapila was the author of the Sankhya system, supposedly. And so, so it's in dialogue with that, of course. But uh, it's actually counter to that because it's, uh, and they, they have thousand years of argument with this, two thousand years of argument with the Sankhas, because they say that the, the Sankhas say they do find the self, and Buddha says you don't find the self, you know, you find selflessness. You know? Although, if you you have to to find selflessness in a way, you end up identifying with the selflessness, and so therefore, in a way, you find. Later on, they have expressions like the great self, or the supreme self of selflessness. So that is your new self, in other words, it's the vastness or something like that. So it, it, it's similar to that. All the, the point is, India uh, had, the inner science in India was a huge, I, th I personally think Buddha was a huge contributor to it, and he kept it away from religion in a way. He found that he, his, his monks, his mendicants, we're not allowed to perform birth ceremonies, naming ceremonies, marriage ceremonies, funerals. If they were clairvoyant, they were not allowed to be divinate diviners, you know, and tell people the future and so forth. He did everything possible to have them avoid doing what priests do completely. And the early viharas, as they were called, were not temples really, they were just residences for the rainy season. And otherwise the monks were just supposed to wander around and, you know, take temporary shelter here and there. The mendicants were. So, so I think that created basically a kind of um, free learning institution. It turns all the ashrams into free learning institutions outside of the Gurukula idea of the father teaching the son and maybe some cousins. That was the previous thing in India at that time. And, uh, and so that, from that, the inner science thing grew. But then, then the um, for example, the authors of all the sutras that underlie what are called the six darshanas, or the six Indian philosophical systems, Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Vimamsa, and Vedanta, the, the, the sutras of those, like the short aphorisms that are the sort of primal thing about those schools, uh, they, they tend to have very little commentary. They're really all written around the time, a few hundred years, or around Buddha's time, or a little later. And, and then there's a silence as far as any comments. There's no known commentaries for about 600 years. In other words, then you start having guys, and they refer to, well, there's been commentaries, they say. But you, nobody has texts for about five, 600 years, I believe, because the Buddhists were the ones who had the schools. And so these guys were not really getting developed particularly, except maybe in interaction with the Buddhists. And then they start answering, and then the minute they do write, like people like, uh, but another kind of Vatsyayana, uh, what, what did there, I, you know, I forget some of the names, of the, uh, no, Gaudarayana, he wrote the sutra, but, but uh, Shankara, Gaudapada, in the Vedanta, Kumarila, in the Mimamsa, you know, the famous writers of them are all about 5th, 6th century of the common era. But, that, but the 400 BCE, they date the sutras of the Sankhya, Karika, is even older, Yoga Sutra, this kind of thing, it's usually how they do it. Because I think the, the, all the Brahmins were going to the Buddhist schools. Because these were non-family schools or, and non-caste schools. So everyone could kind of go who had the brains to do it. I mean, you would. And, and then the deans of the schools were, were, as these Viharas solidified into like schools, they didn't have a big office in the middle, you know, like in the, as a big shot. They had, they, they had to be the policemen at the gate, the four gates. Because anybody came and debated them, if they defeated them, 
then they got to run the school on their ideology, so to speak. You know, their <laughs> thing. And so the best scholars, the deans, were in the gates. And this, and this then became the biggest university in the world, I think, really, the Nalanda one from about 4th, yeah. 5th century to the 12th century. You know, during the European Dark Ages, and and uh, so it's, it's very interactive. For example, in our publishing work, we're publishing the Tibetan translations of the Sanskrit works of these great universities of the you know the combined uh, scientific, psychological, biological, physical teachings of them. And but the Dalai Lama insisted that we also translate any untranslated work of. Um, Sangya, Mimhansa, whatever it was, mm -hmm. because he thought it was would reflourish in a new way if interactive with the old Buddhist thing. Because they're still there, the Tibetans know all about them, but they don't have anybody to debate with, so they are sort of in their own. You know? yeah. Just like the Navyanyaya people, they got where they didn't have the Buddhists to argue with, you know? so then they got a little sterile, you know, their their okay. tradition. And this collaboration um, around the the composition of the early, earlier Upanishads. Uh, the earliest Upanishads were pre-Buddhist, but then Maybe. when you get into, yeah, but uh, that a lot of them are very compatible with Buddhism sure, because sure. there was this totally. a conversation, and I disagree with most representations of Sankhya. In Sankhya, there is no possibility of observing the observer. Uh -huh. uh, this is the very axiom uh, that uh, uh -huh. and such an endeavor is, is silly. Uh -huh. and so Sankhya is really quite an interesting, that is usually misunderstood by most academics almost universally. Probably. And then uh, and only people who actually studied it seem to have any idea what Sankhya is about. Well, the Buddhist argument with the Sankhya is they would push the Sankhya back into this thing that, like, where if your self never changes, then it actually isn't related to you, and therefore, but that isn't within the an Sankhya, answer, answer them. They, there's one argument in one text, anyway, where they, it yeah. says that it's like a stone, that the, yeah. the self is like a stone, doesn't register the thing, and yet it still possesses the knowledge. So then Buddha said, that, that won't work. But <laughs> well, in Sankhya, the, the stone is Prakriti, the, the concept of yes. uh, everything is prakriti yes. in Sankhya. Absolutely. Well, what? But, but what about yeah, Purusha? Purusha? Purusha, the idea of Purusha. Well, the is idea of Purusha is prakriti. Yeah. Okay. The idea of Puru All right. Purusha is prakriti. Uh, everything that is thinkable, observable is prakriti. Okay. Not Purusha. Well, I, I usually like to, I usually so say that. So Purusha the, basically has the same function as Shunyata. It's the shunyata quality of prakriti, and those who those samkhya philosophers who stuck with samkhya axioms, you know, you, you couldn't do anything with them. You know, it was just like really? tai chi trying to like because there was nothing there to catch, and they they knew it. And so it's a very closely, and uh, this particularly is is. You know, and, but Sankhya is so easily misunderstood, okay. as is well, the else. idea of Atman and Paramatman. <laughs> and instantly the mind reifies it yes. into a thing, and then you have a dualism, okay. even though you're claiming to be non-dualistic. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I think the Vedantans don't, they, can, they the don't consider the Sankhya dualistic. Oh, most, oh yeah, but technically so if you actually be look at it, it yeah, right? they could be misunderstanding it. Because it's so easy to misunderstand. Right, okay. Uh, just like it's so easy to misunderstand shunyata oh, sure. as being empty. Right, there's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so easy. Sure. And so it's the same the same difficulty. Okay. Uh, and the, I believe it's, the, it's a, in generally misunderstood. Um, well, that's nice. Uh, Kamchatka has a lot of Sankhya aspects. It yeah, and, with, and all of the tantras the are case. based on Sankhya. Yeah. What? Or what? The tantras. The, so based they, on Sankhya? Well, they use or the, the same categories. Yeah, well, they use all the same categories. Yeah, yeah. All and so does Kala Chakra Tantra, yeah, yeah. but not some of the other ones. Yeah. That was one of the reasons at first they were suspecting the Kala Chakra Tantra, because they have a bunch of Sankhya Terms. language. Yeah. But the main thing is, I think, that any critical 
you know, critical realism, critical dualism, critical nominalism, critical, uh, by Democrat they don't have a term for it, I call it critical relativism. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they are all critical, is the point. And they are not the unthinking person, you know, they all examine life of a certain kind. You know? And some are maybe more skillful than others, some are more religious than others. And, uh, but I think the basic, basic thing about the Indians compared to people in some of the other East Eurasian cultures, maybe all the other people, is the Indians were, are less, were less scared of God than everybody. And so they were more into willing to claim sarvanya, you know, omniscience, that the human being was capable of it, that there, there was such a thing. And, they, and jnana, jnana yoga was more foundational, actually, really, for all of them. Karma, they, then they later say karma yoga so they can go and fight. So, but, but really jnana yoga what is the real Indian thing. It's unique. You know, everybody has karma yoga, everyone has kind of bhakti, but not jnana. Now that's the Indian thing. Knowledge. You save yourself with knowledge, no matter what. So, that, so anyway, that's good. You're redeeming those sankhas. <laughs> well, yeah. And most Sankhya practitioners, or some Sankhyaites, not that there, there are even really such a thing. Aren't any no, they're not really, you know. There's no Sankhyaites. No. Well, but oh, yeah. <laughs> there are also Sankhyaites. Like, there, there are people who list as their, under their titles, you know. Someone who mm. loves Sankhya. Well, Sankhya only means calculation, you know. Yeah, counting. It means counting, is what it even means. Even counting, like, like mathematicians. Yeah, one, two, three, four. Making but the Vaisheshikas are the bigger mathematicians, like the physicists, you know. Yeah. But the Sankhyas are like mathematicians. And I guess they have a bunch of astronomy, too, they have going. Yeah. All of the schools do that. But anyway, they were actively studied in all the Buddhist universities, just like Dalai Lama was talking to all these materialist scientists. A lot of people came to those universities who were not Buddhist. They were open to whoever it was, because it, was not, it wasn't really a religion for people who were using it. It was an educational process. So that's the thing. And uh, Buddhism always it was corrosive of the, of the caste system. That was its main problem as far as most of the Brahmins went. They didn't like that the Buddhists didn't like the caste system. And also the Buddhists said that the Vedas were human, human fabricated. And they were not absolute. Because nothing is absolute. And that's what emptiness means. That, that even, even the absolute is not absolute. <laughs> emptiness is empty. It's so all relativity, that's what it is. We have a question so they, on the other side. Like that. Sankhya doesn't like that. No. <laughs> no. They want to have some absolute Brahmanhood. Um, Mary, this is yes? a follow up question on what Mary just said. Um, well, when you become compassionate and you try to help another person, how do you make sure you're not projecting your conceptions of what the other person needs? onto what they really need, because as Bob said this afternoon, compassion is um, when the suffering becomes just unbearable as your own, but can you really suffer what the other person is suffering? Compared to the, I said compassion comes on its own. It's born of wisdom, actually, yes. So is that what I said? That's what I meant to say. But I couldn't catch the rest of your thing. I heard a bunch of compassion, oh. though. <laughs> which was great. So it's like, how do you know what you're going to do is actually helping oh. rather than hurting. Well, you know, you know, if you care enough, you'll make yourself know. It's like a mother, the, the good mother, the good, or as, as my friend Mark Epstein and Winnicott say, the good enough mother, she knows when the child is hungry, or when it has colic, or when it has this and that, or whether the tooth is hurting, she will know that. And because she really cares. And um, so wisdom, and of course wisdom means that you expand, expand your sense of identification and therefore empathy with the other so that you feel there what they feel empathetically. And you, some inference might have been involved, you know, you can see there like the ball like blah, blah, something or whatever, you know. You, in the Buddhist medicine, uh, you, 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 know, they, you do all this diagnostic stuff, you know. And, um, uh, but the great Buddhist physician knows just by, they can they hold like a, a thread connected to the person or even a piece of their clothing who, who live a hundred miles away and tell you all about them. 
bathed in history, in, in, in uh, Indian medical and Buddhist history. So, so, um, so that's how you know. Yeah, and I think when you are in a situation, um, and as Bob was saying, you have this sense of empathy, and then when you have this true sense and true uh, visceral feeling of uh, asking yourself what will serve the situation, um, rather than being swept up by this emotions or feelings or sensations that you might be getting from the empathy itself. So you have this connection, but then you are able to pause long enough to tune into your own experience, your own embodied experience, and then really just see what it is, see what you are experiencing, and from that space of being embodied yourself, you then tune back into the other person's experience and make a guess as to what it is is going on. And but in that process, there is this ability to uh, let go of your desire to have some end or some outcome to the situation. And so it, it's a, you know, I think if you worry about it, you know, you're more likely to make a mistake. So that if you trust your intuition, trust the instinct, trust the sense of truth that you see arising within the situation, and then really ask yourself the question, what will be the, what is the best thing to do? And it may be on, in some situations that nothing is the best thing to do. Or you might not know. Or you might not know. You, you might not know what to do or how to teach, you know, in a good way. Mm -hmm. But it's an experiment, so you try something. And then you get feedback. <laughs> well, that didn't work. <laughs> and then, if you're, if you're really concerned, if it's, if it's actual compassion, then you'll try something else, rather than, you know... If, if you're open having... to the feedback, if you're open to hearing right. that, you know, you may have made right. a mistake, which a lot of people these I think, days yeah. do. I think one thing that people are embarrassed to say, or they don't think it doesn't sort of fit with our concepts of compassion and so on, is that the real source, the, the empathy is not actually the compassion necessarily. It's the, that's the wisdom. In other words, by having seen true, by having remembered when yourself was seen really solid to you, and having seen through its solidity at that time by failing to actually verify that it was that there is such a solid thing in the center of you then you become more transparent yourself and then you automatically sense what others are doing so it's actually that's actually the wisdom where the compassion comes from is that when you find your own transparency like that by not finding this solid thing like sort of like cork in this bottle then you feel better you feel joy you feel happiness you note that there is joy and happiness in your being and it's from that joy and happiness that the compassion then comes because compassion is, is linked, compassion and love are two of the same coin in the Buddhist way of defining, Indian I think generally way of defining, where compassion is the unbearability of others' suffering, so you wish to t remove it from them, and love is the wish for others to have happiness, and therefore to have that, the, the, the seminal energy of that is the love energy, because the love is out of your feeling well, well how come they're not feeling well? It's not like you necessarily think that, but your, your, your own feeling of well-being overflows toward the other. Because you, real, you realize by having begun to feel that yourself, that all human beings have that capacity. And this one that's all freaked out is because they're all like whatever and whatever happened to them, you know. So then, then you, you really you want to share that happiness. But people normally don't do that because they think compassion is... Oh, the great thing is I'll be just as miserable as all of them. But we'll really sit around and really be glum, and that'll be great. It's like when you go to a funeral, you're supposed to go, oh, oh, oh no, oh, no, no, how could this be, you know? Meanwhile, they're already gone, you know, and, they, and their ghost in the Book of the Dead is sort of around, actually. They come to see who's doing what at the funeral, and then they see some person going, oh, this is terrible. But then they think, gee, something awful has happened. <laughs> What's going on? I, I thought that you know, I was over here to see what Uncle Joe has to say, you know, whatever, you know. 
<laughs> and uh, they, they, the people are going, ah! And then they say, oh, gee, something really bad has happened. Like, what's happening? You know, then they get frightened. And then that's really bad for them. So, you know, cheer up <laughs> is the main thing. <laughs> but we're embarrassed to say that because, you, as you know, we live in a culture where happiness is almost only semi-legal. <laughs> it's not outright illegal. Look at, look at Jeffrey Sessions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's like, guys, prepubescent, a weirdo. I hate to think what he does at his dress up parties. <laughs> Herbert Hoover was like that too. Really frustrated people. So, so that's the thing. Happiness is the key. That's what medicine Buddha is about. It's, it's happiness. And, and we've Love. talked about, you know, in yoga class, you've heard it many times the, you know, the, the, pool of nectar, of compassion, and, the, and that you embody this, it, it, embodying the idea of compassion by getting the drip of nectar to come down from the thousand petal lotus into the fill out your whole body, um, is a way of, of sort of feeling happy, of embodying the sensation of happiness, even if you don't have a good reason to be happy. You know, because happiness is something that you, you know, it's it's something that is a natural state if you let it be there, if you get out of the way. Right. Wonderful. Is there another question? I wanted to mention love to somebody in the screen that we had heard about. Uh, I have another question. It's asana related. Is that, a, is that okay? Oh, there you are. Yeah, is it okay to have an asana question? Oh, yeah? yeah, I hate All to right. interrupt the flow of this. Uh, so, oh, over the last year or so, I've, I've bought your, your books and uh, poured over them. And uh, the language you use to describe the asana is fascinating. And earlier, we, in Parjotanasana and Sukta Padangustasana, you talked about one of the important lessons of primary series is bringing that kidney wing over. And I just wondered if you would expound upon that for a moment and talk about it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Part of my problem is I make up things. <laughs> and so the, the pattern of apana, yes, uh, which governs exhaling, right, and excreting, and excreting, and <laughs> passing gas, giving birth, birth. Uh, giving okay. birth. yes, yes. Uh, all those nice things. Um, that pattern, you know, is moves, it's through the whole body and these whole body lines. And so it tends to make you uh, open the hip joints, lengthen uh -huh. your tail uh -huh. as if you were a dragon. Uh -huh. mm. And it broadens your back like a cobra's back. I find it. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, like that. It makes you strong. Oh, good. I find it. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it's missing in a lot of yoga practitioners that have no. Their apana is weak, and they're all for the prana, which is the complementary opposite. Yes. And, you know, which is just opening your heart, but closing your kidneys. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, sure, I get that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and both, they need each other. And in fact, they are the, the, the two uh, primordial lovers. You know, sure. And we've got to unite them. Mm -hmm. And so, whatever function our uh, illusory self has it's to bring these two together and then get out of the way. Okay, it's just like a farmer might bring the, the cow and the bull together, and then you got to get out of the way. <laughs> uh, or a big trouble. <laughs> so one of the the pattern, the primary series, is to get the apana to drop down to earth so that you feel connected to earth. Uh -huh. And so um, this kidney wing pattern which is the um, releasing of the psoas muscles and the QL muscles up to the back of the diaphragm, uh, allows you uh, then to engage and to connect the arm structurally to the torso, like that. And it is, it's quite expressive, and it'll totally protect your shoulder joint from all kinds of um, bad things that can happen and you'll feel much stronger. 
And so the primary series makes you grounded. And the first half of the primary series uh, involves these oblique movements side to side, mm -hmm. uh, which are part of the apana family. Uh -huh. and, uh, these protect the body in many ways. Um, and it gives you, the, you, you know, you get this feeling of, hmm, which a lot of us are not particularly, and again, back to the, the most ladies uh, have not cultivated this pattern. Uh -huh. uh, they're not warrior goddesses. Okay? Um, they're more like fashion model goddesses, you know. <laughs> and so, and it's so good to feel these. So it's almost like in, in, in Kung Fu, you know, which is also the movement of, of Qi. Uh, you've got to feel this you know, as part of the, the whole chemistry. Yeah, and structurally, the serratus anterior lines up directly with the oblique muscles so that it's almost like it is an actual line. So they go like that on one side and up to meet them on the bottom side from the other side. So it, if you contract those muscles, they automatically do that. Oh. And that's this feeling of, you know, really sort of kind of squeezing the juice out of things. Hmm. Yeah, so in, Rolf, in Rolfing, uh, Tom Myers, who did anatomy trains, he calls the spiral lines. And so, and the reason for this was starting up here at the base of the skull mm -hmm. and coming down across, and you, you move that line, it goes all the way down. And we just have to play with that to mm -hmm. see what we're talking about. But it's extremely helpful. Um, and some people, usually people who uh, are more naturally athletic, uh, seem to get it very easily and then Sometimes it just takes uh, months of like helping the student. Like, wait a minute, let's try that. You know, and then they, and then eventually, and sometimes people never get it. You know, um, but when they get it, they go, oh yeah, <laughs> cool. And that's usually the, the response is cool. And uh, then you start to, you know, then the whole idea of, you know, the, the pelvic floor, then you start to feel how it participates in everything in the body. Um, and so that's just a nice thing about uh, that approach. Um, that answer? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, I think Paul. The other <laughs> uh, can you talk more about uh, Sankalpa and Vikalpa and how they work in human's mind? Sankalpa, Vikalpa. Oh, the what? Sankalpa, oh, yeah. Vikalpa. Oh, the word oh. Kalpa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two. <laughs> um, <laughs> san, san, basically together so and so sometimes when we're doing a, we start out we do a sankalpa uh, in which we use our mind to create uh, a, an intention uh, a, to prepare an offering uh, to a, achieve something uh, that we are then going to you know there's something that is beneficial in the construction mm -hmm. that is sankalpa and so it's it's the use of the imagination uh, in an extremely uh, constructive way. Mm -hmm. um, and Motiv like motivation. Motivation. And that vikalpa is similar, but it actually means divided construction rather than sankalpa. And so it's, it refers more to uh, a, an imagination that then s splits things apart in order to see all the pieces. You know, I've got to open up my computer basically wrecking it to uh, see what's wrong with it. And then uh, after my attack on it, and I've got the, all the pieces all over my desk, uh, I've got to put it back together. And I've ruined the warranty in the, in the meantime. Um, 
But these are these uh, these functions are considered divine uh, within the Sankhya system. Uh, <laughs> which this is neo Sankhya. Okay. <laughs> Clearly made compatible with uh, Mahayana and stuff. Um, so, but the the vikalpa, the, the imagination, then is what allows you uh, to really understand uh, the interconnected nature of everything around you, you know, and all of it. And that's so. That's the imagination, which is a source of huge trouble. A lot of us, our imagination is what tortures us, you know. Uh, but we have all of a sudden uh, seen through the, and we use the principle of imagination to create uh, uh, happiness, to create beauty, uh, mm -hmm. to help others, mm -hmm. truly. And that's, it relies on the imagination. And if you, and just one thing, looking at the, the mythologies of you know, the, the, uh, the Hindu, the Buddhist traditions, this is imagination gone, you know. Some of the stories are just fantastic, you know, like, oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> well, and because, the, because of the wealth of the culture, the greater degree of imagination was allowed. You know, like in classical Chinese, the word se means color and sex, both. And so the libido of the peasant, they, they were only allowed to wear dark blue and sort of brown, you know. And then they they couldn't wear red, or they couldn't, you know, I mean, they, unless they sold a daughter to a brothel or something, that she could wear red in the brothel for the aristocrat. But that, otherwise, they couldn't color that was controlled. So India, there was just so much wealth that people could imagine more. They had uh, parikalpita, by the way, the word there, you put the prefix pari in front of it. Parikalpita means the imaginatively constructed thing. Parikalpita universe, you know, right? Thorough. Thorough pari, pari means like thorough. And uh, so, so that's India. It's really something. Chaika or Bauka or Vilanta or Mimansa, whatever it is. Really great. The yeah, Buddha grew up in, in Kapila city, you know, Kapila Vastu. And they speculate a little bit about, you know, the temporal relationship, but nobody really knows. Is that okay? A lot of tantras are called kalpa raja or something like that. Kalpa is a word as a construct. You know, the king of constructs. There's such and such a mandala or something such. But how much, I know, like I spend so much time imagining stuff. Uh-huh. You know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and not that you know it's true stuff, but it's it, it doesn't have to contra You know, it's more like well, this could be, this could be, maybe that goes like that, and uh, yeah, I'm able to sometimes let it go. Um, <laughs> well, we all do. We thing? all do. It's like our primary function. But the key to intensifying it and making it so more powerful and skillful in our ability to imagine is to realize that we are imagining what we're seeing in front of us. We, we perceive things, we organize our visual perception through images, conceptual images that we have, like a table, a Tibetan table, a computer, a sankhya, a <laughs> yogis. Pound up, pound up, pelvic floor. <laughs> so this whole stupid thing that people say, oh, oh he, meditation means don't think anything. Oh, yeah, meditation. Yeah, oh, I did a great meditation. Finally, I stopped thinking. And, uh, I always joke, I say, when Buddha was enlightened, his first statement was, duh. <laughs> <laughs> don't know mine. No, that's ridiculous. <laughs> But you know, on the other hand, there's a way of saying that you be not knowing, knowing by the path of not knowing, meaning knowing experientially by breaking past your concept. So that you're not just, your concept doesn't structure you, it's apart from what you know. You know? So everything can have a, that's a great thing. There's no dogma in Buddhism, in Buddhist science. Like, like Popperian 
empirical science. No, the all theory is hypothesis awaiting verification from experience. And uh, so that's a really important point, except for that, that statement, that negation, and then in other words, the emptiness. That's not a theory, it's a thing, it's a, it's a result, you could say, emptiness relativity. So what are you imagining tonight? <laughs> sleep? <laughs> Seven more minutes to sleep. <laughs> No, so I was just thinking of this whole idea of stopping thought yeah. that is, is totally misunderstood, yeah. uh, if presented out of context, that, you know, the word nirodha uh, within, say, the uh, entrance of prana into the middle path, sure. and particularly then when prana gets into the uh, chitra nadi, or uh -huh. the, you know, the, the really subtle uh, nadis, the amrita nadi, Oh, that's that you know, thought stops because it, there's a, It's almost like the thought has come to this aesthetic point of like brief, perfect. You know, this exquisite beauty and perfection, uh, and it's like, and it's just like the mind is stunned by the the, the aesthetics right. of, of you know of beauty. thought well done. So it, it it's thought well done rather than thought is a stupid thing. Don't think. Yeah. But thought done well will we'll have moments of neurodha. The, the way you shape from being sub-subatomic, sub mm. if you're conscious of that, and theory, no, I'm not pretending to this, but unfortunately. But the way that, the, the way that thought then becomes how you shape the, the course. Mm -hmm. It becomes a kalpa. But you are conscious of it. Well, thought is only bad when you're being pushed around by your own thought. Right? And then yeah, you can't sad. perceive that your, hurts, yeah. then you can't find your own beauty, the beauty of your own cells. The bliss, your own health is bliss. You know, one molecule in my hand likes the molecule next to it. It gets it on with the molecule next to it. Therefore, <laughs> my hand works. If I get, if it gets pissed off with each other, different molecules, I get cancer <laughs> and die. <laughs> right? Yeah. So actually, everyone has bliss in there. It's really beautiful. You know. You can take a little soma. Make a sign up in case you never did. Okay. Sweet dreams. The clear light of the void is pure love. One last note. Want everyone Michelle to be happy. Michelle had asked um, Michelle Lowe, who's been helping with the morning classes, is helping with people who are brand new to the Ashtanga system. And if you're interested in coming, if you come at 6 o'clock and we'll be in the I corner, um, please join us. And, and, and you could like, just like come the here. last day even. It doesn't have to be every single day. Yeah. So whenever you yeah. feel like. Totally. Thank you. Get some good rest. <laughs> do Bob's. What's that? Do the Menla sleep magic. Okay. Yeah. Meditation? Yeah, yeah. For, well, I'm just telling them to. Oh, yeah, yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <laughs> Mirage, smoke, fireflies, candle flame, moonlight, sunlight, dark light, clear light. Clear light of this. Right? Then wake up, come back up. All perky. Thank you. Cheerful. Thank you. And I will be happy to make up. <laughs> This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special invites to trips around the world with Robert Thurman and geographic expeditions, please visit TibetHouse.us.